One of the joys of being a beekeeper is being able to harvest your own honey. In this video, we're going to show you how we harvested our honey this year and take you through the journey of getting the honey off the hive through uncapping it, spinning it, extracting it, and bottling it. In our process, we found a way that works for us. There's so many different ways to process your honey. If you have guidance and tips, feel free to share in the comments. Just be positive about it. We're two beekeepers making a video, not a video team producing a movie. If you want to jump specifically to some part of the video, just look in the comments. In the notes for the video itself, it'll have a time period as to when things take place. So if you're interested in how to get the honey off, you can go right to that spot. In this video, we'll tell you our opinion for different things, and I'm sure that we're not all inclusive. There's probably some ways that you agree or disagree with what we've done. We're just making this video to share with our beekeepers from our association that uh, have never done this before and kind of want to see what the journey looks like. So enjoy the video. Feel free to leave some comments, tips, advice, but be nice. Don't be a troll. And thanks for watching. We're going to talk about how to get the honey boxes off for harvesting. Both non beekeepers and new beekeepers alike are challenged with how does this happen. There are several different ways to do it. I'm going to go through a couple and then I'm actually going to show you how to use a fume board. First thing to say is you have different equipment that you could use for this. I'll show you two pieces. Both work on this similar principle. This is a triangle escape board and this is an eight-way escape board. The way these work is the triangle side or the eight-way goes down underneath the honey box. The bees will go down through the hole and navigate out of the structure, but they will not be able to find their way back through into the honey super. Now obviously when you put this underneath the honey box, you want to make sure there's no other ways for the bees to get back into the honey box. Make sure it's completely sealed. And the recommendation is about 24 hours, this should be placed underneath before you intend to use and take the honey box. This is a stress-free way to get the honey off of a hive. It really is just passive. My experience, I haven't had a lot of luck with this. A lot of times when I've used this, I come back and the hive still has quite a few bees in it. I'm not sure if they're still operational in the box or they're just not exiting. So I've gone a different route. One thing they do say about this is if you leave it on for too long, the bees will find a way inevitably to come back up into the honey. They'll just keep working at it. So triangle escape board is an option and an eight-way escape board. You could buy these in pretty much any beekeeping catalog. Option number two is mechanical. You can pick up a frame. I'm going to use this piece of wood as a prop. Hold it by the ears and shake the bees off into the hive. Now one of the things about a frame of honey is it's capped, so it's smooth. And it's highly likely that when you shake the bees down like this, quick stop and all the bees fall off into the hive, they will go off and you can clean the frame off. Another thing you could do is hold the frame really tight and with a fist, making sure there's no bees on the tap, give it a quick wrap like this, literally. And as you bang it, the bees fall off into the hive. Third option is to use a brush. When you use a brush, whether you're brushing bees off down in the bottom or you're doing it for honey harvesting, flick, don't sweep. When you sweep, you're basically crushing the bee and shoving it down the frame. Even with honey that's capped, it still is not good for the bee. So using a brush, you use a quick motion and you flick the bees off. Now some people like to use feathers, I have a brush. Those are the mechanical ways to clear it. Now, good, bad, and different. The thing with that is, is as you're doing it, bees sometimes go up in the air and then they come and land back in. It's all a matter of personal preference. 
There's a way that I'm not going to show you today, which is to use a blower. I've literally seen people take their leaf blower out and hold the box and blow the bees out. There's a lot of question about does that do any damage to the bees? Actually, from what I've read, no. I've never personally done it. And I think if you were going to use a leaf blower, there's always, to me, a lot of smell of exhaust in a leaf blower when you're using it, both coming out of the engine and stuff that's recycled to go back through the blower. And I don't want to blow petrol fumes into my hive, so I've never tried that. I've seen a lot of people on the internet use that. That's their choice. Last method I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to demonstrate it in a little bit, is a fume board. This is a fume board device. It's basically a box. It has a piece of coroplast and then a ring that holds the coroplast on. You notice the coroplast or this plastic material is black. The purpose of that is the sun is going to heat this material and it's going to gas off the fumes of the material that you put on the inside, the chemical, and this is a rug or a piece of felt. So the way this works is you use a product or products, there's different types, and it has a smell that the bees do not like. It repels the bees. In this case, the product that I have on hand is butric acid. It's called Honey Robber. That's the name of the product. But there's a bunch of different products out on the marketplace for this type of uh, application. Butric acid, you either love it or you hate it. I'll give you an example. Some people like the smell of a skunk. Good for them. Some people like the smell of this and some people absolutely detest it. I personally don't mind it. I think it's okay. But some people just they cannot tolerate this smell at all. Now the way you use this, and it comes sealed up in this plastic tub here so that you don't have to smell it because even just taking this out I get a huge odor of it. You take the cap off, which is a twist push down cap, and you put a squirt on top, squirt nozzle. It has this little red cap that comes off and a fine point. I'm actually going to spray this because I'm going to use it. You just take it and you sprinkle it lightly. I'll say that much. I don't even know how to tell you what to do, but you saw the action that I did. What will happen is the sun will heat the black part of the plastic and the black carpet and this will gas out and it will come down into the hive when I put it on top and it forces the bees away. Now this is honey robber. There's other ones out there. Fisher's Be Quick is another well-known, well-respected brand and you could look again in a beekeeping catalog. I personally have been through different techniques and in the end I use this one all the time. You're going to see honey supers that we're going to extract in the video that came off of this hive in front of me and this is what I used. The thing about it is it's very quick. When I put this on the hive in just a few minutes all the bees are going to go down. Now when I say all the bees I use that in air quotes. There's always bees, whatever the case may be, that stay inside. And when you bring the hive in, the hive body with the frames, wherever you're putting it, you should expect that there might be a bee or two comes out. Don't freak out about it. They're just trying to find their way back home. So I'm going to put this on top of this hive. These, so the, the ones that you see me harvest today, they were capped and ready to go. This hive had me, they were put on early in the spring, as soon as the nectar flow broke. They, they built those out extremely quickly, this hive. And so I put two more honey supers underneath them. And today, I'm going to look and see whether I can harvest them. So we're going to put this on. We're going to drive the bees out. I'm going to pull a couple frames, look and see if it's capped. And if, if it is, I'm going to take it in and harvest it also. So I'll shut the camera down for now and let me get suited up, light the smoker and get ready to go.
Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is give the hive a little bit of smoke. Front entrance. Reason I'm doing that is I am going to be banging around on the hive up here and I want to make sure that the guards get it smoke. I'm not going to use a lot up top, I'm only going to use what I need. Of course, I forgot my hive tool, so I'm going to go grab that. I'm just going to put a little smoke here in the top, let them know I'm coming. And the whole hive right now has been smoked and I'm letting it get acclimated to what just happened before I go in. That should be a reasonable delay. I think I could take the cover off now. I hear that typical hum. If I were smart, I'd be taking the cover away from me. So any bees that fly out go out away from me. So don't follow what I just did. And I like to take my cover and put it here and any of these bees could fly back into the hive. So I could see lots and lots of bees in here right now and I see capped honey up on the top, and I see new white wax right up here at the top of the bars. So what I'm gonna do is just pry back frame number one, move it out of the way. I'm gonna to come to frame number two, and I'm gonna to look to extract frame number two from the hive just to look and see whether the honey is capped or not. Quick smoke through here just to drive them down on that particular frame. I see a mixed bag. This frame, which is on the outside, is not capped in any way. They're starting to cap this side of it. So I'm just going to set this here for a minute. And I'm going to look at this other frame next to it because it does look well capped. I could see it. So there, this frame is half capped on this side, half capped on that side. And as I look down into the liquid, it looks awful wet to me. So I'll bring it to you. That looks too wet to me to consider to harvest. I don't know, it's just something you learn when you uh, do this, of what dried out means. These bees are still drying this out. I'm going to check the next frame, and I might go a different way here with this. Look how beautiful the white wax is. Bees are calm, they have no problem. So this honey is close, but it's not close enough. There's just too much wet in it in order for me to take it. But my purpose here is to show you how a fume board works. So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put my frames back in and I'm gonna put the fume board on and I'm gonna let it drive the bees down for a little bit. And then what I'm gonna do is pull a frame and you can see the difference in how many bees went from the top of this box down. I don't know if what I put on there lingers enough or whether I need to put more because I put that on a few minutes ago. So what's happening is the sun is heating this up. That chemical is volatile, it's gassing, and it's coming down and the bees will retract. I've put this on and within like two minutes, the entire box is empty, empty. 
Sometimes if you get too crazy with this, you could put it on and the bees will be coming out the entrance. So start with a small amount, and then if you find the bees are not coming out of the box, you can add a little bit more. The funny thing about this product is, it says, apply a small amount of honey robber evenly on the fume pad, remove outer, I'm choking because of the smoke, an inner cover of hive and place fume pad on hive. As soon as supers are clear, remove the fume pad and replace the hive covers. It doesn't tell you how much to use other than a small amount. So what I did is a light little spray. And then if that doesn't work, like I said, add more. Now, one of the things I'll tell you about this stuff, you take this box, if you're out at a remote location and you put it in the back of your car, if you're driving a short drive and it's in a hot car, it gasses the entire interior of your car. So if you're going out remote, grab a big plastic bag and put this in a plastic bag before you get in a car. And even then, I promise you, you're still gonna smell it, but there's times when this just becomes overwhelming inside a closed hot car. So, you know, this has been probably long enough to have some sort of impact. So just for giggles, I'm gonna take it off and let you take a look. But I'm sure you got the gist. They repel from the chemical smell. So let's see what I get when I take a frame out. I'll go back to frame number two where I was. Now I can see the bees are already crawling back up as soon as I removed it. But you can see that they got off of the face. on both sides. So if I had left it on longer, they would have cleared the box. It works in the shade. It doesn't have to be in full sun. And I know people have opted not to buy a fume board and they literally put a piece of paper here and sprinkle that on and put the cover on and do it that way. Again, I think for your investment, you're going to do this over and over. This is the way to go. Now, one of the things about the triangle skateboard is you got to leave it on for 24 hours, which means you can only do one hive a day unless you buy triangle escapes for everything you own. This, you could do this box in five minutes, clear it out, and then go to the next hive down the row and just keep going. I like a fume board. So this honey is not ripe enough. We'll have to stick with what we got. And in a week or two, my bet is they'll get all this covered. I want to have a quick aside about pulling honey and how much you should take. You really need to use common sense. We are in mid-June and there's been a huge and amazing nectar flow this spring. If I take these two boxes, I know that there's honey because I've done inspections in the bottom boxes. I'm going to leave them with proper stores. At minimum, especially in winter, they need 60 to 80 pounds. Now, these European honeybees have a trait where they will hoard excess honey and that's how we could take these. There's some who say when you take honey from a bee, especially if you take a lot of it, they get upset. I don't believe bees have emotions, but I will tell you that I have experienced bees be slightly demoralized. That's the word I'll use to explain it. They're like, where the heck did it go? There's another consideration that you have is that if this hive is banging with bees all the way through, this is living space or resting space in this boxes. And when you take that away, you're condensing all the bees down so sometimes, especially in the middle of a strong nectar flow or a very big hive, when you take boxes away, you should put something in its place. So just keep that in mind while you're harvesting honey boxes. I took a short break and I went and got one of the boxes that we 
finished and put it back on top of the hive. One of the things I want to talk about in both harvesting and bringing back is protecting your boxes from robbing and creating a problem in your yard. I have here a real estate sign. Vera Bradley Bingo. I collected a bunch of these. I probably have two dozen of them. When I harvested the honey originally that you see in the episode, I took one of these and put it on my cart. I put the box down on top of it so the bottom was closed off and I put the box down and then I put another one on top. When I finished harvesting this box, I covered it off with one of those. There's two benefits to that. One, it closes off any of the odor coming off from the fresh honey that could incite robbing. And two, honey's gonna drip that you just finished harvesting. Or when you break the boxes apart, sometimes you break comb, make, make problems, and honey drips all over the place. I don't want honey in the bottom of my cart. I don't want it on the table. I'm gonna set it on and other things. I'd rather it get on this real estate sign and you can see it did its job. There's honey all over the face of this and it, and it just helps keep things a little cleaner and less sticky. So Coroplast, same material that you find in a screen bottom board. You could buy this online, but election day is coming and you know, if you go around and, and ask, somebody typically gives you uh, signs for free because they don't know what to do with them after election day. So that tip I would highly recommend, uh, even using something like plywood, if you have it, any kind of board, just something to cover the hive. Inner covers, spare inner covers equipment, just make sure you don't incite robbing in your apiary. So we're gonna take some frames out of here and show you them. What we're looking for is a frame that's fully capped all the way through. Now sometimes the bees don't finish capping them or they can't reach to cap them. Like this last frame against the wall, they may not be able to cap it because they don't have the bee space to get in there. So we'll pull this frame and we'll pull this frame and take a look at them. And we'll talk about whether the frame is viable or not to harvest. Let's pull that one out. So what you're looking for is fully capped or mostly capped. In this case, you can see there's wax capping across. This is a no-brainer. This one is perfectly fine to harvest. Both sides are good. You're going to look at both sides. What you're looking for is it's either fully capped or, as you see in the corner, some of them are open, and that's okay. You don't want to harvest frames that are, have open um, holes where the honey inside is not f fully cured. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's look at the next frame. Yes. Okay. So this frame you could see pretty good on this side. You could harvest it. Let's look at the other side. On this side you could see that it's not fully capped all the way through. So you have to make a decision. There's some sort of rule of thumb about how much uncapped you can accept in a full box. And you also want to consider what the temperature is and things like that. Right now, while we're harvesting in spring, today it happens to be cool, low humidity. We pulled these and they've been sitting covered. Uh, there's different factors. The point is, honey is hygroscopic. It's going to absorb moisture. And you want to keep the percentage level down. So when you find a frame that has open holes like this, you want to be judicious about whether or not you're going to harvest that because you don't want super wet honey. Now when I look at this, I can see that all the honey is really sunken into the comb and it's very stiff. It's honey. It's not nectar being cured. I would almost say that I think I'll take this frame, especially since the rest of them we know are capped. But if you're uncertain about that, just leave this frame out and give it back to the bees to finish. So sometimes you get a frame and like I said before, you get a part where it's uncapped and you really, really want to harvest the frame. 
Some people will tell you turn the frame over and shake it and see if anything comes out from a liquid standpoint and that'll tell you whether the honey is firmed up enough. I'm not sure that I like that idea. You really don't want your honey to ferment. So one of the things you could do is purchase a refractometer. That's what this device is. You take a little sample, which I'm going to do, of the honey and you can see how thick this is and you put it on the refractometer and put a little sample here and I'm going to take a reading. You've got to hold it to the light and I could see that it's 14 and a half. So I know that I want a moisture generally below 16 percent moisture and 14 and a half is fine so I would be okay to harvest this frame. If you're going to do this where you have some of these frames like this invest in this tool it's not too expensive. And again, they're available on Amazon or some other place. That is the model number, RHB90ATC. Let's take one of these off and just start uncapping it and we'll go through that. So a couple tips and tricks. You notice we're in a garage and the doors are closed. We've learned through years of experience that this is not an activity you want to do in your kitchen. You can, but in time you'll learn that a single drop of honey on your floor makes for a sticky mess and honey gets everywhere. One of the things you'll note in our operation is that We've done everything out here, right to the bottle. We've uncapped, we've spun, we filtered, and we bottled all in the same process. In years past, when we didn't have that much experience, we used to do all those things separately. It's a lot easier to do it all in one place. We used to have every pot in the house filled with honey take it in that kitchen, filter it, it was a sticky mess, it took forever. We've honed this to this process and invested in the tools like the uncapping tank which has helped to speed the process up and different filters. Another thing that you'll notice is the doors are closed. I made a point to say that because if you leave the doors open, the smell of honey, especially on a warm day, will draw all your closest friends. Even if it's super hot, you have to keep the doors closed when you do this. Now we're doing this in June, and the nectar flow is still on. It's a good time to do your honey harvest for spring. If you wait till July, or even August, which you can do if the honey is capped, you're going to find that when the bees are in a dearth, like that happens here in New Jersey, they're going to be on the hunt to rob. And they'll be even more aggressive to get in and get whatever you have going on, meaning uncapping any open honey. In fact, <laughs> there's a bee flying around in here. I don't know how she got in. The other thing that we will say to you is, when you do this operation, honey is hygroscopic. It absorbs moisture. The farther you get into summer, the more the humidity level comes up. And you do not want to leave the honey open to the air where it can absorb moisture. So if you're going to see, we're going to put it right in bottles, but if not, we would store it in pails that are covered. You want to make sure that from uncapping to liquid state, you get it quickly closed up so it's not absorbing any moisture. We've left honey till fall when we had time to do it, winter. It gets very cold and it is almost impossible to spin out. You could put it in the extractor and spin it and spin it and spin it and it doesn't come out. And you end up having to find creative ways to heat a room in your home to get it warmed up over a long period of time because it takes a while for it to absorb any heat 
before you can spit it out. So try to do your operation in the warmth, in the warmer time of year. Same thing goes with fall preparations. If you're doing fall, try not to wait till Thanksgiving to do it. Do it quicker while the weather is still warm. You'll notice that the garage is clean, at least clean for us. <laughs> we cleaned this garage yesterday scrupulously, cleaned everything off. I have woodworking tools. I vacuumed up and cleaned all the sawdust. We swept the floors out and then we took a blower and we blew the entire floor and got all the dust out yesterday. And then this morning came through and cleaned it up one more shot. It's really important when you're making a food product, whether you're keeping it for yourself or selling it, that you keep it super clean. We're not licking our fingers. We're wiping and washing our hands each time. We get stickiness on it. it you're going to get sticky all over. You want to make sure you change the water out and keep everything clean and scrupulous. We set the operation up to try and be as efficient as possible. Off the camera on the side here are all the jars. We put this up on a high uh, table so it's easier to pull them out and see what's going on. We have good lighting. Do yourself a favor and just think through your operation that you're going to do to do your hunting harvesting. It makes it a lot easier. So the other thing you could do is turn some music on. Invite some friends. Have a good time. It's a blast to do this. You could use all kinds of knives, but the key here is it goes all the way across and you can really control how fine the shaving is that you get off of the frame and get it clean. I should lean the frame over. Um, when you're using knives, it's probably be better but awkward to go down. Now, you saw I just nicked a little of the frame. This knife is really sharp. Um, that's good and it's bad, but when it comes to tools, this one is uh, one that you probably prefer. Especially if it's sticking out above, you could just carve it right off straight. Now similar to this, you might have one of these. This is an electric carving knife, same one you'd use at Thanksgiving. This is a Black & Decker brand, they run about 20 bucks. If you look at this one, it's the same thing. And it really does a nice job, and it's left less effort for you on the actual carving part. So this is uh, uh, an alternative that you can have in your kit. This one, one of the blades is bent, so it actually has a little wobble to it. But you could see how cleanly it takes the wax off. And when you practice with it, I'm using it for the first time, you could really get it to where you just get the capping and leave as much honey in the frame and get really thin shavings. So both of these tools, maybe they didn't give the best demo here, but over the course of doing a box, you'll find that bread knives and this type of knife, really good tool to, to use. In the context of taking the wax off, you want to obviously leave as much honey in the comb as possible. The other thing about it is if you look at how cleanly it's removed the wax, one of the things with some of the other tools is they leave a lot of wax debris on top. And when you spin that in the extractor, it ends up clogging your filters. So if you can get it completely clean, that works the best. And this tool is good at that. If you get really good at the bread knife and you prefer to have that kind of blade, this is a really good alternative. This is a cold uncapping knife. 
This particular one is not serrated. A lot of times you find these that are serrated. It just helps to cut through, especially when the wax capping is a little stiff. This one I'm actually using cold and the, the motion of it is not complicated. You just use it to cut underneath. It takes a little bit of force. Now, as a tool, this works better when it's hot. And a lot of times what you'll see is people who use this and their preference to use this, they'll have a hot kettle running right next to the table and they probably have two of these. They keep one in a hot kettle, they dry it off and they use it hot and it helps slice through the wax. And when it gets cooled off, they put this one in the kettle and they use the other one and swap back and forth. It's an okay tool. Uh, our preference would be to use some other ones, but to show you this is a cold uncapping knife. That's the point of it. It works especially well when the comb sticks out past the face of the frame. But when it doesn't stick out past the face, it has the curved ends that you can go in and clean out. And it does a pretty good job. Cold uncapping knife. This is an uncapping scratcher. It's also called an uncapping fork and there's other names for it. A very simple tool, but a very effective tool. A lot of people who uncap honey just use this tool and don't mess with everything else. And as a utility tool, this one works really well. Now it's called a scratcher, but you're not meant to scratch the wax off. What you actually do is pick the wax off. You stick it underneath and you pull up and it pulls the wax capping off and keeps everything free. This is a great tool to have around because when you use other methods sometimes it leaves wax residue on the comb and you could come through and clean it up. So for example if you want to get any of this leftover wax this is where the scratching part or just the picking part goes. If you have a comb that is sunken in this tool is especially effective on that. This is a cheap version. They make stainless steel ones that are pretty fancy. They all work basically the same. This is uh, probably one of the better tools to use. Would recommend that everybody who's a beekeeper have one of these in your toolbox. Now, it's sometimes a little slower than the other methods, but when you get good at it, you can really move quickly through the face of a comb and especially if your comb is not level this is a, a really ideal tool. Uncapping scratcher or uncapping fork. This next tool is a dual uncapping fork or a simple uncapping fork. The difference would be some of them have tines on the front edge of it and kind of work like an uncapping fork. But the premise of this device is that it rides on the flat triangle and this goes underneath the wax coating, wax capping, and it peels away. Now, if you watch the videos of this, it looks magical. What I know is that if the wax capping is a little stiffer, it's hard to use this. It looks great in the videos, not so great in execution. Now this frame itself, the wax is up and above, but over here it's flush. One of the other problems with this tool is as you're going down here trying to get close, the tines actually dig into the wood. Mixed review on this. I'll try to do it and make it look like the video, but it almost never comes out that way. Now one of the things about this is you push down in and then you turn it and you let it ride on the triangle. You have to use the tool right in order to get it to work properly. So I'm going down till I'm underneath and then I'm turning it, but I'm not turning it too much till the tines come up. I want the tines to stay under the wax and I just ride down. Let's 
see if I can make it look like the video. Uh, not too bad. I wish I could have went all the way to the bottom. So not too bad. Um, I know that looked easy. <laughs> I'm going to suggest to you that this is pretty thin. There are times when the, the wax coating is really heavy and it is complicated, difficult. Um, I'm going to give another run at it. And here I'm trying to focus on not digging into the top of the frame. Now I'm using quite a bit of force to push down. And you know, if you use this tool enough, you can get used to it and it's pretty quick and efficient. I don't know. Some days it's good and other days I prefer to use something else, but that's what it looks like. One more shot. Now see there, it really just dug in. Not very happy with that. So, okay, it worked pretty good this round on this particular frame, but this is a, a dual uncapping fork or a simple uncapping fork. They're in all the catalogs now, so you can buy these. This next device is a needle roller. Uh, there's different form factors of this. Sometimes they have plastic, sometimes they're made of stainless steel, sometimes they're called honey punch rollers. There's a bunch of different form factors, but the general principle of this is it's going to prick the surface enough that it creates holes where the honey comes out. There's a pro and a con to this. One, you don't get wax cappings coming off because you're not uh, cutting capping off, you're just opening the cells. The bad news about this is as it rolls through, it leaves wax all over residue, broken up, and then ends up clogging your filter. I'll show you what this looks like. Uh, you simply just run it back and forth until you have punctured all the different wax cappings and cells. When you feel like you've got it open adequately, like that, uh, you can put it in the extractor. Now, the thing about this, like I said, is if I look at this, I'll just pick a different tool, all of these crumbs that are here are going to end up in your filter. And it gets a little bit messy. And the other thing that happens is it doesn't do a great job sometimes at penetrating all the cells, so some of them don't open. It's okay. I would call this one a gadget. Not particularly thrilled about it. Now, in our case, we like the wax cappings. We melt them down and make cosmetics out of them, so we don't mind cutting them off. And what I'll end up doing is cleaning this tool and putting it away, and we'll uncap this the proper way so we don't clog our filter. But this is called a needle roller or a plastic. They're made of plastic. This one's made of metal, uh, stainless steel, and sometimes they're called honey punch rollers, and you can see how it works. This is a Pierce manufacturing electric knife. The bump that you see is the thermostat and it sets the temperature and watch your fingers because yes it's hot uh, to carve. The temperature is preset to cut the wax but it's not supposed to caramelize, get too hot where it burns it. Now one of the things you see is it's magical, really nice tool to use. The thing with this is it does take off quite a bit of the wax capping and you'll see that this frame is probably not going to work as well because the comb doesn't all sit outside of the face. So what you end up doing here is using the beveled edge and carving it this way 
And again, you could get pretty adept at using this tool. And it takes little effort at all. Now these are somewhat expensive. If you're going to be doing beekeeping for a long time, it's worth the investment. There are times if you let it sit that it's going to get hot and the honey is going to caramelize on it. In that case, you plunge it down into the honey down here or shut it off and let it cool off. Now this particular one is a set standard. You can see it's smoking because I'm not using it. You should just keep using it is the key. That keeps it cooler as you do it. Now, shut the camera off for a sec so I could turn the heat off. Uh, this is another knife similar. This one has a dial on it, you could see, and it allows you to adjust the temperature up or down. You could also buy heat knives with a control box, and the control box has a dial on it that it does the same thing as this particular brand. This one you just use a screwdriver and you set it that way, but on the dial box you could dial it up hotter or lower depending on what you're doing with it. So there's a couple different versions of this device out in beekeeping catalogs. You can take a look if you're interested in using a hot uncapping knife. One thing about this, I'll just show it because this one's not on. When you do it, you notice that I tilted the frame forward and I went from the top down. If you go from the bottom up, it ends up riding over top of the knife and melting and, and heating and caramelizing on the knife. And it also allows whatever is melted to drip down along the comb. And you don't want to do that. So tilt the comb forward and work from the top down when you use a heated knife. One last comment about the hot knife. Sometimes as the hot knife goes through, it actually seals or melts some wax over top and you have to take a capping scratcher. I'm not sure how evident it is, but there is wax melted over top of these frames and all you do is just go through with your capping scratcher and open them back up. Now a lot of times when you put it in the extractor the force will make it blow through that super thin layer but when you're done just hold it down at an angle and you can see that some of these are closed off. I can see these right here. Maybe it doesn't show up in the camera and all I'm doing is just breaking the seal. This is a typical heat gun you could buy at a box store, Milwaukee brand. I'm going to put it on low. This is another technique to remove the wax. A lot of people really like this. It's hit and miss, I think. Uh, you'll see as it melts the wax, the wax doesn't go away. It just pulls and it ends up sitting on the outside cell of the or the outside rim of the cells. Now sometimes it leaves a glaze and when you put it in the extractor it's still almost like covered with wax. It's going to make noise while I turn it on but you'll get the gist of it and we'll get to show you what it looks like. So once this comes up to temperature and starts to melt the wax which is at 145 degrees you'll see that it just comes away and it exposes the honey. I, you know, it works pretty well. You can see that some of the cells get capped by the wax that is melted. Now, I would use this on low 
If you put it on high, you have the possibility that you're going to caramelize the sugars and give it an off taste. And you're also really going to melt some of your comb and you don't want to do that. Now what you could do with this is once you get it to this state, if you just want to clean it up a little bit, like I said, just take the tool and it makes it really easy to pick and you can clean it up very quickly. And next you're going to get the ones, you really don't want to stay in there and go crazy, but this is guaranteed that it will open up the cells for you. And once you get the heat gun warmed up, I turned it on cold, it goes through frames pretty quickly and some people really like this method. This uncapping tank was sold to us by Daydon. That's where we purchased it. Just a quick look at what it looks like. It's made of heavy duty plastic. It feels kind of brittle, but we've had it for a good number of seasons. We've never broken it. You can see how the bar attaches. It just simply clamps underneath. And of course it has the nail that you use to set the frame on to spin around. It has a false floor with holes and slots for the honey to drain through. And then on this end is a gate for the time when you want to drain this honey out and filter it further. You don't really need an uncapping tank. They sell different things to put on top of pails and other options you could use. You could literally carve over top of a pot if you want to. We found that with the amount of honey that we do, uh, it was really nice luxury to have one of these and we invested in one and we've used it for multiple seasons. I would tell you to look around at various catalogs when you make this purchase. There's a new product out, uh, came out this year called the Hive Butler that allows you to transport frames and it acts secondarily as an uncapping tank, so it's dual purpose. So that's why we would suggest look around and see what's available in the marketplace. As she finishes up this frame, one thing to note is that this is crimped wire foundation, meaning Inside the honeycomb are support wires that keep the honey frames intact when you put them in an extractor. That's opposite from foundationless, where you let the bees build all the comb naturally. And the difference is if you run your extractor, start slow and build speed. And if you're using wired foundation, you can probably get all the way up to the top speed if you get it right. But you also risk having a blowout. A blowout is when you have so much weight spinning at force that it actually pulls the comb out from the frame and destroys the honeycomb and creates a big mess for you. Typically, you don't have that issue when you're working with crimped wire foundation which is why they wire the frames. Now the other thing, look at the tools and her hands. Every once in a while while you're working maybe a single box gets finished every one of the tools gets sticky, the, the handles get covered, the tools fall down into the honey. Take a moment, clean up, wash the tools off and then start again. It's not very comfortable to be working with sticky tools and it's not safe at some point because your hands are not having the grip that it's supposed to have if you're working with say the knife. So wash your tools up. One thing you'll note in the shot is this bucket of water. There's warm water in there with a little rag. You tend to get sticky fingers doing this stuff and it's always a good idea to keep your hands clean.
You saw the before, I wanted to show the after. This is the frames coming out of the extractor. They're pretty good. Um, still a little honey in them, but that's okay. The bees will clean that up. The one on the left was done with a capping scratcher. The one on the right hand side is the one that was done with the heat gun. And you can see there's a little bit of left residual honey in there. But it's pretty good overall. Just wanted to show the outcome of the two different methods of cleaning the capping wax off and how they came out of the extractor. I want to give you a quick tour of the inside of the extractor. This is a Maxant Model 3100-3100. It's motorized. It has a dial that you turn to spin the basket. You can spin it fast, spin it slow, it's adjustable. It's not an on off switch. If you look inside the tank, it has a basket that holds the frames in a combination manner. What I mean by that is they're radial and tangential together. Explaining what that means because if you're looking to purchase an extractor, you'll see those terms. Radio, the top or the bottom of the frame face the outside. Think of it like rays of the sun from the center out. Tangential, if I go from the center to the outside and I turn the face, I make a T. That's how you remember radial versus tangential. There's pros and cons of that orientation. Obviously, this frame, only having one face, fling to the outside of the tank will empty and then you have to stop and turn the frame around. These frames will empty both sides at the same time but it takes longer to do it. Now one of the things you'll note in the way that we have the frames loaded the top goes to the outside. The reason being is if you think about the orientation of the cell they're angled up and when you angle them up, that allows the honey to come out to the outside. I'll just spin this a little bit so you could see what it looks like. That's what it'll look like and we'll show you some other shots. Now one of the things that you don't see on the tank is the covers. But when you're running this, you want to make sure that you put the covers on. As this spins, it creates an air vortex inside and it really does, like a fan, create lift and all the micro particles of honey float up and out of the tank and land all over everything. You'll find that every surface is coated. So as recommended, when you operate this, make sure that the cover is on for both safety reasons and practical reasons. Now they sell different versions that hold more or less uh, frames and you could look at the different catalogs and see what's available out there. This particular extractor is owned by our Northwest Club. It's not our personal extractor. Different beekeeping associations make arrangements where they buy this piece of equipment because it's somewhat expensive and then they loan it out to various beekeepers across the season so they can extract their honey. So sometimes you can join a club or make an inquiry of your club to see if they have an extractor. They're expensive so sometimes they require a deposit but it prevents you from having to purchase your own. Now when you run the extractor what we try to do from our instructions is start slow, let it spin just a little bit to get some of the initial honey up, and then you could go a little bit faster and a little bit faster. It almost always is impossible to run the thing on full speed, and your mileage may vary on that.
the feet of the extractor. You see they're fastened to these boards. These are old scrap boards. They were cracked so they were not usable. It's really important I think to secure these to the boards. The boards lend weight that hold the extractor down and it also creates a big stable base like the tripod. It's just a matter of simply fastening them with these screws. Now one of the things about this, as you can hear, there's a little bit of a wobble that goes on a lot of times because the frames are uneven. And you'll see the entire device starts to shimmy. And if you turn it up the right way, it'll really, really shake. And having it fastened to those boards helps prevent it from walking across the floor. And you know, what ends up happening is you don't pay attention the extractor wobbles away, the port goes away, and you end up with honey all over the floor. Ask us how we know that. So take the time to get a couple boards or something, even if you screwed it to plywood, giving it a base really, really helps the operation of the device. In this shot you see a bunch of different filters. Our favorite one of course is the one we're using. It has the two wires that help it sit over top of the bucket. You can see it's pretty full. We're about to stop what's coming out of the extractor and let it drain a little bit. You see the spatula in there. Every once in a while scrape the bottom of the filter just to clear the wax out and give a path for the honey to fall through. Now around the perimeter here you see a bunch of different filters that we've picked up. If you go to a yard sale and you see a different filter you pick them up and we use them. We still like the one with the two wire loops that help it hang over top of a bucket. The front bucket, the one on the bottom of the screen, has a super fine mesh filter. You would think that's the way you want to go, but it's so fine that when honey has wax in it or any debris it doesn't flow through it. It has to be a super warm day and you have to clean it all the time. We would recommend you filter through a mesh that is coarse to medium and if you look at the ones in the foreground they're about the right size and then if you want to filter it again you could run it through a finer filter. It would seem counterintuitive that you'd really want to have a fine filter, but in the beginning what happens is the wax lays down on the filter like flakes and it completely clogs the entire filter. And every once in a while you need to stop the honey from flowing out of the extractor and let it drain through. Now one thing about this extractor, you'll notice there's no gate on the extractor, it's open. That's on purpose. One of the things you do not want to do is allow the honey to back up inside the extractor to the bottom where the, bo where the bottom of the basket is flowing through the honey, you'll burn the motor out. So our club specifically does not put a gate on and we have instructions printed that say do not let the tank fill up too much. Always allow it to drain. So we're at that point right now where we're going to take a break and let this filter through a little bit and then we'll extract some more. In the previous video we were running the filter without the internal filter. It was shot separately to show you what it looked like. I just wanted to shoot another segment showing this is how this little filter nests inside the big one. We were not running it at the time that you saw the filter but the purpose of this is as the honey's draining from the tank any of the particulate matter especially the wax cappings will clog this filter and then you take this filter out and clean it 
and it allows the finer filter to continue to strain. This is a double sieve filter sold by Brushy Mountain who's no longer in business but maybe there's other versions by other vendors out there and you should look around. But this is a good way to go because you don't have to stop and clean the main filter you could just take a break and clean the inner filter and it does make the operation a little more efficient. So we've cleaned everything up. We've actually done quite a bit of bottling already. And in this video I want to just show real quickly the way that we actually get the honey from the food safe buckets into the jars themselves. And you can see we have some examples here. First thing is you want to start with clean jars. This one's used. That's okay. As long as it's clean and there's no rust. And you can see that we've used other honey jars. Um, these are from our canning supply when we make jellies and things. We use old jars all the time. So when you give a jar to somebody, tell them to return it back. Uh, really helps. It's simple to fill the jar. Wash your hands, which I just did before starting this. This is a honey gate, and all you do is just open the gate. And I don't know if the thing is set. Yep, that's a lock. Open the gate, the honey's going to flow. You want to fill it to just about the rim right here. Try to be equal with your fills if you're doing honey shows. Now this honey that you're seeing flow through is the last vestiges of honey that we had. It's not super filtered. It's for our own personal use. But all of this honey was filtered really, really well. This is the honey that's drained out of the capping tank. I'll talk a little bit about whether or not um, you could multi-filter this in a moment. So I think you get the gist of this. You fill your bottle till the desired level and then you just close the gate. Wait for it to stop pouring. It will in one second. Just be patient with this. And you're all done and you can make sure you put the jar on. Now if you get to the point where you are storing your honey, you don't get the bottle at all at the same time, use food safe buckets but make sure you keep a lid on it. You keep reiterating that honey is hygroscopic and it is going to absorb moisture and you don't want that. Now this honey that came out of the capping tank has some particulate matter, matter in it and it could be filtered again. And that's the point of showing you this device which is a stand. The point of putting this bucket up here is so that you can grab another bucket and put it underneath and then you would put your filtration system under, over top of this and filter into this bucket which also has a gate and then you can finish with this bucket. So that's the purpose of this stand that you see. You really don't need one. You can, as you see, put it right on a table and filter it out here. So it's not complicated. One of the questions we'll get is how much honey did we get? Out of this batch when we might measured it up it was 80 pounds. You have to keep in mind that some of the frames, four of them, were not suitable to uncap because they had open honey. It was not capped off and we did not want to introduce that moisture. So we got 80 pounds out of this batch, two honey boxes, and that's a pretty good score for one hive. So it's just a matter of filling all your jars and a honey gate goes a long way. It's so much better than scooping out of the bucket which causes all kinds of issues and it's dirty and messy. So highly recommend that you buy a bucket with a gate on it.
When you're finished harvesting your honey, you could take the box of harvested frames and put them right back on the hive they came from. The bees will clean up any of the excess honey and they'll restructure the comb. And if you're still in the nectar flow, they may actually be enticed to fill them up quickly. There are certain times when people will take a box like this, put it outside and let the bees come and clean it up from the neighborhood. There's mixed reviews on that technique. Some say doing that will give the bees a taste for robbing and when they finish cleaning this up they'll start looking at other hives. I believe that especially to be true when there's a dearth or an absence of nectar for the bees during a dry spell. For me personally, I'm going to put this back on the hive it came from and let them clean it up. And then if the nectar flow is over, once they get it sorted out, I will take it off and store it in the garage. When you store honeycomb like this that has only had honey in it, no brood, no bees being raised, you can typically store it in a safe place for use next year if you don't want to leave it on your hives and it will not be impacted by wax moth because they're usually after the larva and the cocoons and things left over from raising bees. She's doing a preliminary rinse with hot water. One of the more important things is to make sure you pour it over the basket to get any of the wax that's stuck off because that's the hardest thing to clean. And she has multiple pots and she'll just keep rinsing this with hot water. So she's going to give it a quick rinse. The job's not done until the cleanup is done. To start with, she's going to cover the motor and make sure it doesn't get wet. She's not going to spray the motor, but just to make sure that no water gets in it. She's got it covered with a plastic bag. You want to take your time doing this. Just spray every surface with cold water. Try and knock all the wax out. And if it's really super dirty, you can undo the screws and take the basket out. Just take your time, make sure you rinse every surface. Sometimes you could rub it off to get down to the metal if it's sticky. But usually a good rinse will do a vast majority of the job. Now we have a large restaurant pot sitting on the stove heating water up. It doesn't have to come to the boil, it just has to be hot. And after she's done with this, she's just going to rinse it down with hot water. And then she'll turn it over and let it dry, leaving it out in the sun. But first, turn it over, let any residual water drain out of it, and then leave it out in the sun to dry out. And it should be ready to go for the next user. The Device does require some maintenance. Read the instructions on it. This one in particular, you can lubricate the bearing. But from what I know, you could use it multiple, many times before you have to do that. But what I would tell you is rather than me guess at what the instruction is, if you purchase one of these or borrow one, make sure you read the instructions. This is a brand new device that literally was just purchased and so therefore it's not going to need that service.
When you're all finished, one of the things that you could do is protect your equipment, keep it clean. In this case, we've taken our capping tank and some of our buckets and filters. We've wrapped them in plastic bags. We keep them in our garage and with the workshop sweeping the garage and other things, dust, dirt accumulate on it. This just keeps them clean for next time. One of the keys is you just have to rinse it off when you're ready to use it. And there's not a lot of accumulated grime. So when you're done, wash your stuff off, dry it, and then seal it up in bags for next time. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is give the smoke a little bit of hive. No. <laughs> this is a simple bread knife. This particular brand of bread knife happens to be a Costco. You could use any kind of bread knife. Cutco. Cutco. <laughs> Next if I show you... <laughs> Tweedle, tweedle. Tweedle, tweedle. <laughs> Funny. And this next device I'm going to show you is a needle roller. They call these a... <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Tweedle, tweedle. Needle, tweedle. <laughs> Needle, tweedle. <laughs> okay, stop it. <laughs> Let's pick it out of the thing. Come on. Just be over with me. All right, so Sharon's going to take a couple frames out of here. <laughs> Does it taste good? <laughs> okay, come on. Ready? Ready. Take one. Take five already. All right. Be serious. Ready? Okay, here we go. 